Good morning again. How are you guys doing? All right. Good to be in the house of the Lord, right? Amen. If you would uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read the, the whole chapter, but we're going to focus on the last part. And Lord willing, we will finish the chapter today. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 10. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So again, in this chapter, we see that Paul has switched his subject and he has changed uh, those who he's addressing. Primarily in this chapter, Paul is addressing the false teachers and the false apostles in the church of Corinth. Those who were stirring up trouble, those who were stirring up trouble in the church against Paul by mocking him and by saying evil things about him. <clears throat> One thing that they would mock him by, they said that he was only bold when he was away and when he was writing to them, but when he was present, his presence was weak and his speech contemptible. With these words, they were really attacking Paul's character and they were judging him by his outward appearance. Obviously, when they say that his bodily presence is weak, but when they say that his speech is contemptible, they are saying that he is displaying cowardice, which is deserving of scorn. They are calling his speech despicable, pitiable, and sorry. These men and these false apostles who stirred up trouble against Paul were obviously blind. Here is the greatest apostle next to Jesus before them, serving them with fervent love and leading them into the ways of Christ. But all they see is a physically weak man who's deserving of scorn. And, and so they try to stir up the people against him. Now, think about it from Paul's perspective. As we have seen and read the sincerity and the love that Paul has for the Corinthians and for this church. And to know that there are those who are mocking him for his, his bodily presence, for his, uh, the weakness of his flesh. And to call his speech contemptible. How this must have grieved Paul, the apostle, the one who begot in this church in the gospel and who was a father unto them. How he must have been grieved by those he loved so much. But we shouldn't be surprised because we've seen this in man's heart ever since the fall 
beginning with Cain and Abel. And I'll just lay out a few examples of this. Cain slew Abel out of pure envy and hatred because Abel was accepted in the sight of God, but Cain was not. And ever since then, there has always been enmity and strife between the children of God and the children of the devil, between the children of light and the children of darkness. You look at Joseph. Jo- Joseph was one who was chosen by God to save his family and to save even the, the whole world at that time from a famine to come. He had the favor of God upon him and even had the favor of his father. And so his own brothers turned on him. They conspired against him and they threw him in a pit and they left him there to die. His own brothers did this, and they did it out of pure envy and jealousy and hatred towards him. We see David, who loved King Saul, and David served King Saul with uh, a fervent love, with sincerity, and with humility. David loved King Saul, but because it was obvious that God showed favor on David more than Saul, Saul sought to kill him because of his unquenchable envy and the evil that was within his heart. Not to mention all the prophets in the Old Testament who loved Israel so much, their own brethren, that they spoke the truth of God. They preached the truth of God to them, even at the cost of losing their lives by their own brethren. And we read in Revelation that those who have been slain and the blood spilled, that their blood will not be forgotten. It says in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under... The altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that, that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So all those that were martyred for the sake of God's word and for the sake of their testimony before Christ had the spirit of Christ in them, willing to give their lives for the truth of God, to glorify God, and for the love of their brethren. But yet, out of hatred and envy, they were killed. And all those that came after Jesus, who, and even into this day, who out of love for God and his word and out of... uh, the testimony that they show among the lost and among this world are, have been killed and will be killed. But all of those that have been slain and the blood spilled uh, for God's sake, for the word of God's sake, and for their testimony's sake, that blood will not be forgotten. But ultimately, Jesus was the one who deserved no death. Ultimately, Jesus, who was the Messiah, the Son of God, who was perfect in all of, all of his ways, we know was killed He should have been received and accepted by his own people, and yet he was rejected and he was hated by them. How blind they were, the ones who should have seen, who said that they saw, who said that they weren't blind because they had the word of God given to them, and they taught the word of God to others. And they're the one giving uh, the word of God uh, who had um, authority at that time. The religious leaders in the day of Jesus had authority to teach the word of God to others so that they might understand but they couldn't even see the Messiah when he came. They should have received him and accepted accepted him, but they were blind. And they judged Jesus by his outward appearance. Though he had done many miracles and many mighty works were done by him, displaying the power of God, they said, that is, the, the leaders at the time said, that he blasphemed the name of God and that he did miracles by the power of Beelzebub, or the devil. And then they crucified him for this. So my point here is that no matter how sincere the servant of God is, no matter how clear the word of God is presented, and how much love is shown for the lost, that there will always be those who are blind to his ways and have hatred towards his children and servants, even in the midst of the church, as we see here in Corinth. And let's pick up at verse 12. <clears throat> and that's who Paul is addressing. He's addressing those in the church who have a hatred towards him, who have stirred up people against him, and who have set themselves in authority in the church. But they were false teachers, and they were false apostles. And we see this is the rule that they, they live by in verse 12 of uh, 2 Corinthians 10. Paul says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. 
but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It seems pretty obvious to me in this chapter that those that have opposed Paul, have accused him and mocked him, are the ones that have set themselves in a place of authority in the church. And Paul says, but I will not count myself as one with them, as though Paul had commended himself into his own place of authority as an apostle. No, Paul did not place himself in the authority of apostle. Paul was called by the grace of God. As he states in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, Paul says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Then Paul says, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And then 17, he says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which are apostles before me. When Paul was saved, and he received the abundant mercy and grace of God upon his life, and he realized that God had placed a calling upon him to be an apostle, knowing that he did not deserve this. Paul will say in many uh, of his writings that I'm the least of the apostles, or not deserving to be an apostle. But yet God had called him to be an apostle. When he was saved and he realized this calling was placed upon him, he was not concerned with the will of man or the opinions of other men, not even the other apostles. Paul's only concern was with God's will for him, to learn the gospel and to preach the gospel to the heathen and to reach them uh, with, with the gospel, with the word of God. But these men who opposed Paul and have seemed to set themselves up in the church of Corinth with their own authority in the church were much too concerned with the praise and the thoughts of other men. They measured themselves by themselves and compared themselves among themselves. They were pleased with being accepted in the eyes of men. They were men-pleasers as you see that in, in Ephesians 6. And they were very unwise in, in wanting to please men rather than to please God. These men who seem to have a place of authority in the church of Corinth placed the acceptance of men higher than the acceptance of God. Just like as we heard on Wednesday, I heard a part of it online, but uh, just like King Ahab's prophets who only prophesied good things to him, even if it was contrary to the word of God. These false prophets were more concerned with being accepted by King Ahab rather than by God. Because they would go against God's word and preach something different that was contrary to God's word to please Ahab. They weren't concerned about pleasing God. Unlike Micaiah, who spoke the truth of God and prophesied that to Ahab. And he was not concerned whether he was accepted by Ahab or not, that was one of the reasons that Ahab hated him, because Micaiah always spoke the truth. He would speak the truth to him no matter what. And here he's warning what's going to happen to him uh, in battle. But Micaiah prophesied the true word of God to Ahab, and he was smote on the cheek, and then he was in prison for it. But he was more concerned with the will of God, and he was more concerned with being accepted in God's sight than in men's sight. Even if it was a king, he was more concerned because God is Lord of all. But we, like Paul, are not to worry so much about what other people think of us. We are not to compare ourselves and measure ourselves by the outward appearance of men. But we are to continue to to look into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God. And it's by this word and by faith in it and the spirit of God that we are changed and conformed into the image of Christ. But it's an inward changing. Of course, the the outward actions will show, but the change comes from within, in the inner man, in the heart. And that's what we should be concerned with. And if we are going to compare ourselves one to another, we should do it by the word of God. We should encourage one another and provoke one another into good works. As iron sharpens iron, as you're looking into the word of God and I'm looking into the word of God and we're both striving for the kingdom of heaven, we can compare ourselves in that way to encourage one another, to press on but only to press on to look like more like Christ and only to press on into the word of God to be conformed by it. But we should not place the opinions or the will of men above that of God's. I admit and confess that this has been and is a weakness of mine, worrying too much about what people think. And I confess this before you and I confess it to God. But I pray, as Paul had asked the Ephesians in in chapter 6 to pray for him, that utterance may be given, that I may be able to open my mouth bold, boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, not being concerned of the persecution, 
or being rejected, or whatever may come, but to speak the, the word of God boldly without being ashamed of it. So I pray for that grace. And this is what Paul boldly boasts in, in uh, that this is what Paul so boldly boasts in, that is the measure of grace that was given to him to preach the gospel. If you look at verse 13, Paul says, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. The rule in which Paul governs himself and measures himself or judges himself by is the grace of God according to the word of God. Paul will not, or he will only boast in what has been given to him by God, which in return he glorifies God with. Paul was called to be an apostle, and so he'll only, call, he'll only boast in that I am what I am by the grace of God. As he so wonderfully writes in 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, Paul says, but the grace of God which is with me. Paul knew of the grace and the mercy of God and how that by his grace he was able to labor more abundantly than, than they all but only by the grace of God that was with him. So he'll boast in what was made ready and what was given to him by God, which is the grace of God. It was a gift of God. It was by the grace of God that Paul was called to be an apostle. And it was by God's grace that he labored more than the other apostles. And it is by God's grace that through Paul's labor, labor of preaching the gospel, he was even able to reach Corinth, as we see in verse 13. A measure to reach even unto you, this measure that was given to Paul as a grace and through the labors of Paul, by the grace of God, Paul was able to reach the, reach the Corinthians with the gospel. And so he'll boast in that, by God's grace. And through the authority that God has given Paul as an apostle, he was able to preach the gospel to the Corinthians. And a church began there. Souls were saved. New life was given to those who believed on the gospel. So Paul rightly boasts in the authority that God has given him as an apostle. And even the authority was stretched to Corinth, as we read in verse 14. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel. Again, Paul assures the Corinthians that Corinth was within his divinely established limits of his apostleship. Paul had authority over the church of Corinth. He was a father unto it. He had began a work there. He was the first one to preach the gospel. And so his limits of apostleship reached Corinth. And they should acknowledge that. And so Paul would boast in what God has given him. It was by God's grace that Corinth was under his authority and that he was able to reach Corinth. But Paul boasts in this that God has given me the authority even unto you, even over you. But Paul, as we see in verse 15, will not boast in another man's Labors. Paul says, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Paul's not boasting in another man's labors. That is, he's not stretching his authority beyond the measure which has been given him. Again, that Corinth was within the measure that God has given him by preaching the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.6, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And we see in this that Paul was the first to plant the seed in Corinth. Though Paul, Apollos and others have helped in watering the seed, yet Paul can still say that he had begotten them through the gospel. As he, he, yeah, as he says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, he says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. And as a father to them, Paul's desire was to see their faith increased. As, as a true apostle and minister of God, he desired for them to grow in the knowledge and the understanding of God and to grow in faith in God himself, as God is the one that would give the increase. And Paul desired that through their faith, his opportunity to preach the gospel would be enlarged to the regions beyond Achaia, or beyond Corinth and to the remoter parts of Achaia, and even further Paul's sole desire was to see the kingdom of God increased. 
We see in verse 16, he says, To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things met, made ready at our hand. Paul said this, uh, in other words, a few times in this chapter, that he's not going to boast in, the, in, the, in, any one, in, in another man's labors. Or here he says he will not boast in another man's line of things made ready at his hands. As Paul emphasizes this point again, it seems obvious that this is what the false teachers and the false apostles did or were doing in the church of Corinth. They have set themselves up in authority. They have commended themselves in authority in the church of Corinth. And they were leading some astray and stirring up people against Paul, but by their own authority. And they were lording over what God has given Paul as his own heritage. And they were even, and my, this is my opinion, they were counting the work that Paul had did in starting that church as their own work, as if they had started the church there. And so they were boasting in the labors of Paul and planting this church as if it was their own labors. And they were lording over another man's heritage and flock. But this they did vainly, puffing themselves up by their own commendation. And look at verses 17 and 18. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Again, Paul's boast and his glorying was only in what the Lord has given him. And he returns all the glory back unto God who has given it to him. Because he deserves the glory for it. So Paul can say that he labored more than them all. Even the other apostles. But when he says that, he's boasting in the grace of God. Because, because he says, but only by the grace of God which is with me. Men like to commend themselves of their own achievements and vain accomplishments. But let us as Christians recognize that we are only empty vessels. And if we are going to do any good for the glory of God, it's only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God that we can. But let us look at, at what uh, we can do by the grace of God. God's grace is, is powerful and enabling, and we can do more than we probably think we can do by the grace of God. But not by our own will, not by our own strength. And then, so it is not man who boasts in... The, it's not the man who boasts in or commends himself that is approved, but it is whom the Lord chooses, and it's whom the Lord commends that is approved, as we see in verse 13. And so lastly, let us note this, that just as we see children uh, in a family, when one seems to have more favor from the parents or in the parents' eyes than the other one, the other one usually is filled with jealousy and envy. We see this in grown men as well. These false teachers and apostles sought after authority. They sought after titles. And they sought after the praise of men. Remember, they, they, they considered the praise of men and the acceptance of men higher than God. And that's what they went after, was the praise of men. And they were in, but they were filled with envy and jealousy because of Paul. Because these things were so freely given to him by God. But Paul didn't desire these things. He didn't desire to have a title or to have authority, to, or have the praise of men, but these things were given to him by the grace of God. So Paul was chosen, and he was approved by God. But all Paul boasts in is that he is what he is by the grace of God. And, and so he glories in the Lord, which is contrary to those who are stirring up trouble, trouble in, the, in the church of Corinth. <clears throat> so let us learn from this that... Uh, let us not compare ourselves among ourselves, especially in the outward man, but let us strive to be more like Christ, and let us strive to grow in the inward man. And whatever good is done in us or through us, let us glory in the Lord and give him all glory for it. <clears throat>